Hey everyone, welcome back to Bagel TCG. Today we're going to be making a deck tech video for Fatigue Oldham, and we're going to be looking at is this deck good and what makes it good, as well as how to beat it. So we're going to be looking today at this Oldham list. This is um, pretty similar to the second place list um, from the Calling Indianapolis. I believe Charles Dunn piloted that, so congrats to him. And if you want to see regularly updated deck lists, uh, I finally got my Patreon up and running again. Um, I've also made this kind of okay website. Uh, it starts off with a way to help people pick out their heroes. It's also going to have a regularly updated uh, tier list here that I'll be doing my tier list on. And then two things that I'll have for Patreon is once Outsiders comes out, I will have a draft tier list and draft guide for it. And then um, I have these regularly updated deck lists right here. Um, you know, these are deck lists that I'll, I will update as I'm playing them. Right now I have five. I have Bravo, Dorinthia, Viserai, Oldham, and Briar. So, you know, instead of just being a static deck list like you get from one of the videos, this will be updated regularly as I play it. Some more than others, obviously, as I'm playing more, some heroes more than others. But currently, this is the main thing from Patreon. I think it's, I have it at just like $5 a month to support me and uh, get access to the regularly updated deck list, as well as the draft stuff once it comes out. I also have some cool stuff like tokens and sleeves and play mats hopefully coming soon. Um, but let's hop into the video. Thank you for the support. Check out the description. Let's look at this Oldham deck, right? So Oldham lost Winter's Whale, and because of that, it lost a lot of its offensive power. It no longer has a weapon that always is hitting for four or applying a Frostbite, right? So now we have a much weaker weapon in Titan's Fist that isn't even always four power and doesn't have any on hit. So he had to pivot away from his more offensive ability since he lost his powerful weapon and towards his defensive capabilities, right? Centered around Crown of Seeds, Rampart of Ram's Head, and his hero ability, right? So the few things he can do is he can every turn, turn a card, a blue or a yellow into two blocking value through Crown of Seeds and Rampart of Ram's Head. And if he is against a deck that deals arcane damage or through some other way, he can sometimes utilize that last resource as well. This means you're blocking with one less card every turn in terms of losing cards from your deck but you're still maintaining that life. Similarly, his hero ability, Ice Reacts either slow the opponent down, so they have lower damage output, or Earth Reacts block for two without using any cards blocking-wise, right? So both ways also don't use any cards that go to the graveyard and can block. That's kind of the main thing. I think Sledge is mostly just for the mirrors, um, and then you've got your Arcane Barrier for Wizards, you will probably run just AV1, like Null Rune Boots, against Rune Blades. Um, and then you've got the kind of the classic setup otherwise. The main deck is a bit different than you would expect from, um, you know, the old, more aggressive Oldham, because we're using a lot of these life gain cards. We've got three Sigil of Solace here. This is the best one because it's an instant, so you can play it at any time, especially on the first turn of the game, it's pretty nice. But at any time, it's pretty good to have this. Just gain three life, doesn't use any action points. Then we've got these slower ones in the form of Sun Kiss and Healing Balm. Um, these, you know, gain you three life, but they do require an action, so it's your whole turn. They do block for two if you really need to, but it's often better since we're trying to fatigue our opponent out of cards. It's often better to gain three life than deal three damage or four damage with Titan's Fist. The rest of the deck is just mostly blocking cards. We've got Sink Below and Fate Foreseen here to block, um, Pulverizes and Oakenolds. Uh, these are pulverizes aren't always in here. This is probably the first card that comes out. This is kind of matchup dependent, but uh, it is a card that attacks for a lot without actually using many cards, right? It's one card to attack for 14. The rest of the cards all go back into your deck. So a pretty efficient card for fatiguing opponents there. And then Oak and Old, we're just running two, and this is mostly for second cycle, right? You're very rarely going to naturally draw Oak and Old plus a blue and an ice card and an earth card. It's pretty unlikely, so this is mostly for second or even third cycle as we're going through the deck and we're pitching Oak and Old with our, uh, any of these ice or earth cards and blues to make it happen. And then it's a pretty powerful effect, obviously, getting it all off together. Um, looking at the rest of the deck is basically all blues, a few yellows. We've got three yellow Autumn's Touch and two yellow Winter's Grasp. Um, these are basically for the Oldham reaction. You can use them together, pitching them together to get both at the same time. Um, that's a, one of the main reasons we do it is to pitch uh, you know, a yellow of one and then the blue of the other. 
but also you can use it just to uh, activate the ability and then pitching any other blue. And then you can still use those extra resources to activate Rampart of Ram's Head, Crown of Seeds, anything like that. So we have a few, they also block for three. Um, and then we're running the blues as well, obviously. Brother in Arms lets us use that extra resource that we've been talking about. Often you're just gonna pitch a blue to um, Crown and Rampart and you'll have one floating. So we can use Brother in Arms there, use that resource and get some two extra block out of Brothers in Arms. We've got Channel Lake Frigid. This card's just too good not to run, and it's an ice blue that three blocks, so we play it anyways. Um, and then we've got a bunch of attacks that are all blue three blocks. We're not usually attacking with these for the most part. They're just blue, and they block for three. We've got one staunch response just to have a blue defense reaction here, um, mostly pitching it for blue, but sometimes we'll use it as a de-react. And then we've got Heart of Fendal. You are going to cycle sometimes three or four times with this deck, and this can gain you three or four life, which is pretty powerful. For basically, excuse me, for basically no uh, no, no detriment to yourself most of the time. Um, and then the sideboard, we've got a few key things here. Oasis Respite is very helpful. Um, often you might want to play these over the Pulverizes. You can kind of switch three for three there. Um, but this deck is also pretty happy going over 60 cards. Because you're trying to fatigue your opponent, you're trying to be the last person left with any cards in their deck. Um, you know, it's okay to have more than 60 cards. We're not trying to win based on the most efficient deck possible. So it's okay to add cards and go over. Honestly, most of the time, I would probably not take cards out. I would just add cards in from the sideboard that we want. We have the Steadfast. This is a good card into any of the Arcane decks. It blocks for five here. We're running the yellow of Staunch and Steadfast. I prefer the yellow to the reds. It's one less on the rate, but because it's a yellow, we can use it to activate... Crown of Seeds and Rampart of Ram's Head, which is pretty nice. The yellows staunches, if you draw them together, they can actually play each other, which is nice. You can pitch one yellow staunch to play the other. So I like having the yellow because of the flexibility, being able to turn them into a Crown and Rampart ability um, if it's not a good turn to play them and you have nothing else you can do with them, right? But staunches are nice. It can be a two for six defense reaction here against any decks that go tall. Or if you put four more resources into it, it's a, uh, it's a six for nine block, which is pretty nice as well. And then Steadfast, this is basically just for any of the Arcane decks. You can also use it as a defense reaction against the Dominate decks, so other Guardians, and then Icelander and Kano, this is quite good against. Um, the Imperial Warhorn is for any of the decks that can set up permanents that we need to stop, so mostly uh, Dash and Icelander are the main two that this is going to be good against. And then we can cycle it with these two Remembrances we have. So... Against Dash and Icelander, we're going to want the Warhorn with the Remembrances. Um, the Remembrances otherwise are mostly just for decks that we uh, we think are going to try to fatigue with us. So maybe other Guardians, um, Dorinthia possibly. Uh, we could also be worried about you know the Dash and the Icelander, like I said. Even Briar has the Evergreens now. So um, if it's an aggro deck like Phi that you don't think can fatigue you as much maybe your remembrance doesn't work as well there but even then the remembrances are never bad and you could just always run them um, you really need to think about if you think the opponent can fatigue you back and then these remembrances are pretty helpful they can get you powerful attacks if you need them they can get you healing cards um, or they can just get you straight up cards to block with so quite a lot remembrance can do for you here um, but a lot of the time they're going to be cycling this imperial warhorn and then these Oasis Respites are also good against the same thing that the Steadfast and Staunches are good against. Arcane decks for like Steadfast, um, and then go tall decks like the Staunches. But it's also pretty good against Rune Blades because it works very well against the Rosetta Thorn. And any deck that's attacking for a lot of values of four, it can be pretty good against. So that's kind of a, cap, a recap of the deck. Um, it's a lot of just blocking out your game plan really for almost all your matchups is uh, to be just fatiguing them. You just want to block with all your cards, heal up as much as you can. Um, and now let's talk about, one, if this deck's good for the meta. I personally don't think fatigue decks are very healthy for Flesh and Blood. I hope either the meta, you know, comes to a place where this deck's not as good through any kind of, um, you know, people playing more cards like Remembrance or playing combos that can get through this, playing cards like Evergreen like Briar has. Hopefully this either gets hated out of the meta or Legend Story Studios bans like Crown of Seeds, for example, something that is making this deck a little too degenerate or Remembrance, stuff like that. 
Um, I don't know if they're going to take those steps. I think they're waiting to see how the meta unfolds first. I think there's a, a calling Auckland maybe that they're going to wait and see for how that goes um, coming up soon. But uh, I don't think it's particularly good for the meta. It's not a fun feeling, especially for newer players that um, it, it takes some skill and strategy to get through a fatigue deck. It takes pitch stacking, understanding how to slow down against it and then speed up later. Um, so I think it, it's a bit of a hard time for newer players to beat these fatigue decks and they're not going to enjoy sitting there for 50 minutes as all of their cards get blocked and the opponent runs them out of cards and is at 30 life still right so um, I, I don't think it's very healthy for the game and hopefully it either gets weaker or banned out um, but there are a few ways to beat it so let's let's talk about those um, the main one is if you have a card you know the easiest one I should say is for Briar for example has cards like evergreen that will cycle infinitely, right? So if you have cards like Evergreen that cycle over and over or Rites of Replenishment, those are pretty good. Another way is through setting up permanents. So decks like Icelander, Dash, and Dromai all can set up a permanent like a, an item or an aura or a dragon that is hard for a fatigue deck to get through and will eventually win you the game. So those decks have a better chance into um, this fatigue ultimate as well. And then if you don't have either of those options, your best way is to set up, you know, kind of weaker permanents. You might want to play some energy potions or time snap potions and then set up for bigger turns, right? If all you do on your turn is play an energy potion, um, the odds are the Oldham can't do that much back, right? They might attack you for a little bit of damage here. They're likely not going to be lucky enough to get one of these pulverizes or an Oaken Old on you. So it's probably a weaker attack or just healing or attacking for four, right? They're not going to threaten that much. So if you're, you know, a Fi or a Ranger or anything like that, um, you can play an item like an Energy Potion or a Time Snap Potion to set up for later turns. You can Arsenal a good card, and it's not that bad if all you do is play one or two cards out and then Arsenal, and then you set up for a much bigger turn where you either pitch stacked for it, so you're putting, for example, Art of Wars, Channel Mount Heroics, Rain Razors back into your deck for later, or if you can draw into a few of them when you already have setup cards out, like Insidious Chill for Lexi even, then you're able to do a lot bigger turn and push some damage through. Um, the real goal against Fatigue decks is they can maybe block on the lucky side, like 14 or 15 with their hand, right? Um, but likely they can't block much more than like even 16. So if you can get a turn that's much bigger than that, if you can set up a turn that deals 30 plus damage, um, then you're going to be able to push through damage on them, and they'll also be on the back foot because they might not get an arsenal there um, if they want to block enough. So you can try to set up two or three of those big turns throughout the game. Um, that's really the main way to beat fatigue strategies is through a few big things like that. Also, small poker, small pokey attacks, I should say. So if you can attack for like two, for example, a few times, um, it's harder for decks like this to block that because they're trying to block for three on everything. So it's a lot better to attack for two six times than six twice, right? So um, a little bit of an example there of how you're able to bleed a little bit of damage through. But those are kind of the main ways to beat this deck. I do hope uh, they either get rid of a card or the deck gets hated out of the meta. I'm excited to see what Outsiders brings. Hopefully, if this deck is still around in Outsiders meta, they print some tools to beat it in the generic slot. But very excited. Let me know what you think of this deck, what you think of its place in the meta, if it's healthy for the meta or not, and uh, if you've played it with or against it, any tips in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching. Remember to like, subscribe, comment. I'll see you guys next time.